All right. So now I'm going to define for you the, the notion of a manifold. And uh, in particular, this involves um, the discussion of charts uh, and atlases. Okay. <clears throat> so let's say we have a set M. Okay. And then um, you have to endow, it's like this set um, with a topology. Um, <clears throat> so the basic idea, if you will, is that um, you need to introduce a topological structure in M. It's like to make sense of the notion of continuous maps. Um, so, um, so I'm not going to go too much into details. It's like, but the essential idea is that it um, <coughs> makes sense of what it means to have uh, open sets. It's like in uh, in the set, and then the basic idea then is that uh, a continuous map is something whose uh, Pre the pre-image of an open set is open. Okay, so so the topology it's like sort of sort of defines, if you will, uh, what uh, open sets, uh, and uh, allows one to uh, make sense. Continuous maps. Okay, and the idea of continuous maps are that they're the property that uh, a map is continuous if the pre image of an open set is open. So, um, so again, it's like I, I won't go too much into the notion of uh, what uh, sigma algebras are. It's like uh, um, <coughs> where sort of the sets, it's like have certain properties. It's like we have to do with unions, it's like uh, and intersections, um, and they're closed under um, some appropriate combination of unions and intersections. Okay. Um, Anyhow, so, so you have the set M, it's like a, there's a topology, and topology allows you to make sense of the idea of continuous maps, okay? And then, um, then you have uh, a coordinate chart um, let's say phi, which is a map now from a subset U, it's like of this biggest set M, okay, into an open subset of uh, Rn, well, Rt, okay? Um, so, so this is a, a coordinate chart, okay? Um, often denoted by uh, u and phi, okay? So the domain it's defined on, it's like, and then the, uh, the map itself. Um, and then oftentimes it's like, uh, you know, we drop the domain of definition, right? Often we drop the U and just refer phi um, for uh, u phi. Okay, um, so what this uh, coordinate chart as the name implies does is that it takes, okay, so, so you say this is m, which is uh, your set, which is going to be later some sort of manifold, and then there's some um, domain u here, okay, and this is going to map to a open set in Rd, okay? And what it does in essence is that it takes a point x, okay? And it gives you a bunch of coordinates on it. Uh, 
So let's say um, x1, x2, x2, xd. Okay. Okay. So, um, <coughs> so if you're given a chart. and um, x in u, right, then phi of x, which is in rd, right, is out of coordinates. So one way to sort of think about this then is that the chart gives you a way to locally identify some neighborhood or some set that's like on the manifold M um, with um, a quad with basically some open set that's like an RD. So it gives you, <coughs> and uh, and it has to be a bijection. So uh, so it has to be uh, one to one and onto. Right. So this is a bijection. So one to one, and it's on to, and uh, both the forward and the inverse maps are continuous. Okay, so, so what it does then is that it gives you it's like a way of writing down it's like that point it's like as a d tuple of numbers, okay, which we think of as the coordinates of x with respect to this coordinate chart. Okay, uh, and then locally what that does is that it endows it's like this set with <coughs> a Euclidean structure. Okay, so one way to sort of see this is that because you have a bijection, if you look at coordinate lines, it's like on RD, right? They map back to a coordinate patch on a manifold as well. Okay, um, so um, so in particular, it's like what that allows you to do is to make sense of what it means for um, you know, say functions defined on a um, manifold it's like to be um, to have some sort of regularity uh, for example you know um, differentiability of various sorts okay um, and so we'll see how that happens <coughs> so coordinates sort of coordinate maps or coordinate charts Right, allow you to <coughs> sort of relate objects defined on the manifold well technically I guess you right you contain within this manifold okay with uh, sort of objects <coughs> on the subset. Um, yeah. Okay, image of this open set, okay, by the coordinate chart, which is contained in RD. Okay, so um, so perhaps the easiest example is if you imagine that you have a function f from the manifold to the rails. Okay, so you have a map from R, it's like uh, to, well, you have a map from something from the manifold to the rails, and you might want to ask, it's like, well, how smooth is this function? Okay, so the problem is that you, uh, you know, you, you don't really have any uh, clear notion of this, uh, and but we do understand uh, what it means for a map from, say, um, RD to R. It's like to be smooth. Okay, so uh, so it's natural to look at the basically the coordinate representation like of this function, for example. Okay, and the coordinate representative um, is related in the following way. So all right, so you have this map f from the manifold. It's like to the rails. We have this coordinate chart from some subset of the manifold to 
um, some open neighborhood of Rd. All right, so we can imagine defining a function here um, um, just um, in such a way as to make the diagram commute. Okay, so what you basically have to do is that you have to, if you want to go here, you want to go basically like this, right? So this thing, this map here then is uh, phi inverse composed with, uh, f composed with phi inverse. Right, so this then is a map from, um, let's say, um, phi of u, right, to um, r, okay, phi of u is contained in rd, okay. So now it's like you have a map from rd, or some, at least some open set in rd, it's like two rails, Right, and then we can talk about how differentiable that is. Okay, um, so um, so this gives you some way of thinking about the differentiability. It's like of this function f, which originally is, on, is a scalar value function defined on the manifold. Okay, so um, so the problem, of course, is that right now we just have one single coordinate chart. Okay, so which is uh, phi, um, and what you would like to do, of course, is you'd like to cover it's like the entire manifold with coordinate patches so that the union it's like of the domains or definition of the coordinate charts um, cover the entire manifold. Uh, and then if you do that, uh, the worry if you will is that, um, or the issue um, is that you will have um, overlapping domains of definition. And then so if you have that and you want to talk about say the differentiability it's like of this function f, which again is defined on the manifold, but we make sense of the notion of differentiability by looking at what is essentially the coordinate representation of that function f with respect to a particular coordinate chart. Uh, and we ask whether that map now from some subset of Rd to R is, you know, has an appropriate number of derivatives. Um, the problem then is that, you know, you could have overlapping regions. It's like where um, you have two charts which have an overlapping domain, okay? And so you want to be able to show um, that this notion of differentiability of this function f is independent of the choice of the chart which you've used uh, in defining this local notion of differentiability, okay? Uh, so it, it turns out that in order to make that all work out, um, there has to be some compatibility between charts, if you will, okay? Um, so the basic idea then is that, um, so the chart, the coordinate chart allows one to define some notion of differentiability. terms of the coordinate representation of f, okay, which is uh, this map, or this composition f composed with phi inverse, right, but we want this to be independent of the choice of chart. Okay, and the point is that if you want it to be independent of the choice of chart, then you need um, some compatibility between charts in some sense. Okay, um, so, so let's see what I mean by that. So now we're going to imagine that there are two charts uh, on the manifold uh, with, again, an overlapping domain, okay? So we have, again, this picture, but now there are two charts or two domains. So let's say u and v, and then you have two charts, okay? Let's say phi and psi, and they each 
give you a, a map. It's like a bijection. It's like from this u. It's like to some uh, open set uh, in R D. The same thing is true here. Some open set in R D. Okay, and then uh, what is relevant is that there's this region of overlap. Right, so this shaded region here is the image. It's like under phi. It's like of this regional overlap. Okay. All right. Um, so uh, as before, you can then ask whether there's a map from now this overlap region, right, which is phi u intersect v to psi u intersect v. Okay. Uh, and and you, what you want, of course, is that you want this to be um, um, <coughs> be differentiable enough in some sense. Okay, so um, so let's just go in one direction, and the other direction is sort of obvious. So if you want to go in this direction, right? Again, you you go in such a way as to make the diagram, or you sort of traverse this diagram uh, through another path. It's like, and then you want this diagram to commute. So this uh, map is just defined to be uh, sort of psi sort of uh, <coughs> composed with uh, phi inverse, okay? So uh, psi composed with phi inverse, again, it's a map from uh, <coughs> phi u intersect v to psi u intersect v, and then both of these things are subsets, open subsets of Rd. Okay, so again, it's like in some sense it's a map from Rd to Rd. It's like you can talk about, um, you know, how differentiable that map is. Okay. Um, all right. So, so this sort of uh, this is some notion of compatibility. It's like and it goes into, um, well, okay, so sort of the properties of this. Uh, change of coordinates map, if you will. So this is a change of coordinates map. So the, the sort of the differentiability, it's like of the change of coordinates map uh, is going to relate to, um, you know, the properties of the structure, it's like of the atlas you impose on this manifold. Okay. Um, so let me maybe just state it here, right? So there's this idea of a C infinity atlas. On sort of M, right? Into RD. Okay. <coughs> it's a collection of charts. So I'm going to index them by alpha. So u alpha, uh, let's see, so phi alpha, okay, of m such that, following is true, one, that you want the, you know, again, the domain definition of the charts, it's like to cover the entire manifold. So we want union over alpha of u alpha to be equal to m. Okay, so the second thing is that um, if you have two of these things, then this change of coordinate charts has some nice property. So for any sort of pair, let's say alpha and beta, right, uh, where the there's some non-trivial overlap with u alpha intersect u beta is not the empty set, there's a non-empty overlap, okay, then uh, the image, right, of each of these, open in Rd, Right, these are, this is, this overlap regions. <coughs> and the change of coordinates map. <coughs> uh, 
<coughs> which is uh, phi beta composed with phi alpha inverse. Uh, is uh, C infinity. Okay, so we can talk about C, infin C infinity functions because these are maps from open sets of RD to open sets of RD. Okay, so we can talk about uh, the usual notion of differentiability. It's like which uh, we know it's like from just the, uh, the Euclidean, well, I mean, just the linear vector space case. Okay. Um, all right, so, um, so this is what's the notion of the C infinity atlas. Okay, it has these two properties that again, it's like you have coordinate charts which cover everything and then that there's this change of coordinates map, um, which you can see in this picture, right? With the property that, you know, the change of coordinate maps are smooth. It's like, and then, you know, basically the inverse is also smooth. Okay, all right. Um, And you can say that these uh, elements of the atlas overlap smoothly, All right? So the elements of an atlas obviously are the charts, right? All right, um, so, so this sort of introduces this important notion of coordinate charts, and in particular, the compatibility conditions between coordinate charts, which form an atlas, okay? And um, so the reason, again, it's like why you want this property that the atlas is the infinity, okay, is more or less that, um, you know, earlier on we had tried to um, motivate uh, the idea of using a chart uh, to make sense of, say, the differentiability of a scalar value function on the manifold, okay? Uh, and we did this by saying, by definition, if you will, that this function is differentiable or smooth if the coordinate representative of this is, uh, you know, it's like differentiable or smooth, okay? Um, but that is sort of by fiat, and you still have to check that this is well defined in the sense that it's independent of the choice of the chart, okay? And, and I'll just say that if you happen to then have a C infinity atlas, uh, then this is going to be independent of the choice of the chart, okay? And more or less, it's like the way you show this is that, um, you know, it's like you, you do what you've done here, right? You have the two coordinate charts, you have a map now from, uh, you know, it's like M, it's like to, uh, to the rails, it's like by F, or more generally to some, you know, it's like uh, something else. Uh, in, in fact, it could be a map from one manifold to another, okay? And then, so you have, um, you know, it's like you have this map F, it's like, and then you have the two coordinate representatives, um, and then more or less everything still works out. So maybe let me just try to draw that out uh, so that you have some idea as to what's going on. Um, and, um, <coughs> and I'm going to drop the, uh, the domains. It's like just because it's a little bit confusing, but it should be fairly clear um, from the context um, what the domains of definition are. Okay, so, so let's say we have, uh, you know, these two regions again. Let's call that U alpha, U beta to be consistent with the notation we have. And then we also have a map from the manifold uh, by F to the reals, okay? And then there's this <coughs> sort of coordinate representative. There are two coordinate representatives now, okay? Um, so, Okay, 
so there is a, a map f composed with um, phi alpha inverse, right? So this is the coordinate representative of f respect to uh, phi alpha as your coordinate, and then there's a coordinate representative of f respect to phi beta. Okay, and let's say this is ck uh, differentiable, right? So this is in ck. All right, and we want to say that if you know something is ck here, that's also ck here. All right, and that converse is also true. Okay, so the way you do this is that um, you know that f composed with phi beta inverse, right, is just defined to be f composed with phi alpha inverse composed with phi alpha composed with phi beta inverse. Okay, so what it is, if you will, is that you now have the property that the other coordinate representative, right, so this is the local coordinate representation f respect to the u alpha or the phi alpha coordinate chart and then this is uh, the coordinate representative of f respect to the phi beta coordinate chart right and and so you have these two things right the local representative with respect to alpha local representative with respect to beta and then this is the change of coordinates map right so this is a change of coordinates map This local representative with respect to beta, and this local representative with respect to alpha. Okay. So basically, the idea is the following, right? So if you can, if you differentiate this, it's like um, so. The ability to differentiate this is related to the ability to differentiate uh, the local representative with respect to beta and the ability to differentiate the change of coordinates map okay, by the chain rule. Okay? And the point is that if you have a uh, atlas which is C infinity, then you can differentiate the change of coordinates map any number of times you want and not have a problem. So the only limit to the differentiability it's like of the local representative with respect to alpha is the differentiability of the local representative with respect to beta. And this more or less means that you know, the notion of differentiability of a function, okay, which I had previously defined just in terms of local representatives of those functions, right, is independent of the choice of local representatives. So it's independent of the choice of chart uh, which I've uh, used in constructing the local representative. So, so that's, that's consistent and that basically means that, you know, this notion of the differentiability of a function which is uh, which has the manifold as a domain is well defined. Okay, um, you can go further. It's like where, as I said, instead of just having a map from uh, M, it's like to the rails. You could, in principle, have a map from M to some other manifold N, uh, and then uh, you you can again check that everything still makes sense. Um, and the way you do this, of course, is that um, you know it's if you have a map from M to N. Right, then they each again have charts. Um, so let's say this is on RD, RD. Uh, so let's say RN for the other one. Okay, and then your charts, uh, phi alpha, phi beta, psi alpha, psi beta. Okay, and then that defines for you <coughs> you know, the local representatives of those maps, right? And you can again check that uh, the relationship between the local representative, it's like on the one hand, this is related to this map, um, but you have to, um, you know, apply change of coordinates uh, maps on both sides, okay? So, uh, so that's not so difficult to figure out, right? Because you want, if you want to go from uh, yeah, if you want to go from here to here by going around this diagram, right, then you have to, um, so let's call that uh, G, if you will. So let's call that G uh, alpha and G beta. So this is saying that G beta 
right, is equal to, um, so I'm going to do this first. So this is one change of coordinates, and then this is G alpha, and then there's going to be another change of coordinates. Okay, so this is a change of coordinates. on M, and then this is a change of coordinates. Uh, on the manifold N, okay? So that's not so surprising. And again, it's like, you know, by the chain rule, uh, <coughs> sorry, by the product rule, uh, actually. Well, no, um, by the chain rule, it's like you can, you can show that uh, everything is still well-defined, right? Okay, so, um, that's, uh, that's showing you that, you know, the notion of differentiability of maps between basically now generally manifolds to manifolds is well-defined and independent of the choice of coordinates so long as you have C infinity atlases for each of the manifolds. Okay, all right. So, so now we can uh, see a little bit more about atlases. So we say that two atlases are equivalent. Okay. So let's say two atlases A1 and A2 are equivalent. All right? If union A1 union A2 is an atlas. And if you recall, it's like the, uh, the the property which is relevant here, right, is that the change of coordinates uh, between, it's like the charts, it's like each of these atlases uh, is again smooth, right? Okay. So, all right, so, so these two are equivalent, right, if, you know, the union of these two things is again an atlas, okay? And, uh, and more or less again, that's saying that the coordinate charts, it's like in each of those two things, it's like overlaps smoothly with each other, okay? So, all right, so now given an atlas, A, all right, we let uh, A plus be the set of all charts, U phi such that um, a union this chart is still an atlas all right so so you should think of this uh, as in some sense the completion of the atlas so if you have an atlas you're going to add all the compatible charts to it Okay, and um, so it is easy to check. That um, A plus is uh, still an atlas, so, so also an atlas. And uh, which we call the maximum atlas, maximal atlas, or complete atlas. Which is generated Then, uh, all right, so then what happens is that two atlases are equivalent. You can show that two atlases are equivalent if the maximal atlas generated by each of them are the same. So, So if the 
generate the same maximum atlas. Um, and then we refer to such uh, a maximal atlas as a differentiable structure um, on M. So maximal atlas. M is a differentiable structure. Okay, and, and the reason, of course, why we call it differentiable structure is because this allows you to make sense of how differentiable functions defined under the manifold M are, right? So, uh, so again, it's like to recap what we have so far. If you have a set. Right, you want to, and you want to talk about the notion of say continuity and differentiability of functions. And that first, you need a topology to make notion uh, to make sense of the notion of continuity of maps. Okay, so once you have that, uh, then uh, you can also introduce it's like this notion of charts and atlases. Okay, and the notion of charts and atlases then allow you to relate, you know, the differentiability. It's like of uh, functions and maps. It's like on the manifold. Um, to the usual notions of differentiability, it's like which we are familiar with uh, for vector spaces. Okay, and in order to show that this gives you a well-defined notion, you have to have that the charts which you use, it's like uh, on this manifold, are compatible in the sense that the change of coordinates map is uh, C infinity. Right, and if that's the case, then uh, you know trying to define the differentiability of a function just in terms of the local representative is independent of the choice of local representative. Okay. So um, so let me just sort of say briefly that um, <coughs> you know oftentimes um, that's all one chooses. Right. Is um, on this manifold is this idea of a differentiable structure. So, so it's possible to define an abstract notion of the manifold. It's like by just having a topology and a differentiable structure. Um, in practice, though, it's uh, you um, you want to add a little bit more structure to it. So, so sometimes, so a manifold. Is sometimes. Find <coughs> as a set with a differentiable structure. Um, but the problem with that is that uh, you can sometimes uh, have some um, pretty strange topologies, right? But this can result in sort of rather strange topologies. Uh, which have implications, it's like particularly in the context of uh, you know numerical optimization. Uh, so in particular these You just uh, specify the differential structure, right? You uh, can't exclude. Um, you can't guarantee that uh, convergent sequences have a single limit point. Which, which of course is a, is a big deal because what we want to do, basically, it's like when we're doing the optimization approach, is that we want to have an uh, iterative scheme. It's like which generates a set of points on the manifold, right? Which is convergent, and we want to show that it limits to a well-defined limit, uh, which oftentimes is the minimizer you're hoping to achieve. 
Okay, so, um, so what you want to do then is you want to add some additional uh, sort of structure to this. So you don't just want a differentiable structure, you want uh, what is called a manifold structure. Um, so you want, uh, so, um, so to avoid this, you want that <coughs> the topology induced by a plus right is Hausdorff and second countable. Okay. All right. Um, so, so let me just sort of briefly say what these things mean. So the Hausdorff property basically means that there's. Uh, <coughs> so this implies that. topology satisfies a separation axiom which is to say that that if x and y are in m and x is not equal to y, right, then there exists an open set containing x that does not contain y. Okay, all right, so this uh, Hausdorff property, it's like, uh, has this separation axiom. And then second countable sort of implies that if there is a countable collection, say B of open sets, Say that. Um, let me rephrase that. Second countable means that there is uh, a countable collection of B of open sets, right? Such that every open set is the union of some collection, some sub collection of B. So there's a sense in which the topology is generated it's like by this countable collection of open sets. Okay. All right. So the, the reason why these properties are important besides the issue of uh, having unique uh, sort of limit points of uh, convergent sequences um, is this notion of partition this, of unity. So this is important. the existence of what are known as partitions of unity. Okay, um, and, and I'll say um, <coughs> how these two things, it's like, um, are related to this notion, and then I'll say in words, it's like why partitions of unity are important. Um, 
so essentially what happens is that um, so this is important for the existence of partitions unity because uh, the existence of such okay okay let's see because it is related or it is equivalent to sort of the property of paracompactness. And um, a house of Atlas topology is paracompact. second count. Okay, so so the bottom line, if you will, is that uh, so the reason why um, we want to have these additional properties that the topology induced by the atlas is both Hausdorff and second countable is because that implies that uh, you know you have pair compactness, which uh, then is related or is equivalent to uh, the existence of partitions of unity. And partitions of unity, as the name implies, are really just scalar valued functions um, which um, have. So, one way to sort of think about this is that uh, you have, um, if you say have an atlas, right, um, then you want to have a collection of scalar valued functions uh, with the property that associated with each atlas, sorry, associated with each of the um, charts that's like on the atlas, you have. Um, you have one of these uh, functions um, which <coughs> which has support which is contained within the domain of definition of the atlas okay and and then um, so you say that that you know it's like partition unity is then subordinate to uh, this atlas in some sense okay and um, and then you want the property that um, when you uh, if you have a point, it's like on the manifold, right? And you look at all the set of atlases, so you look at the set of all charts, it's like which have uh, that point in the domain of definition, and you look at the associated uh, partitions of unity, and you sum up those function values at that point, then they sum up to one, okay? So that's one thing. And then the other thing is that, so you have this subordinate feature that the supports are contained, it's like within the domains of definition, you have that, you know, point-wise, they sum up to one, you also have that they're, you know, it's like non-negative and that they're smooth, okay? So all these things together then uh, give you the important property, um, which is sort of the reverse process, right? So, um, so far we've been using, um, you know, the atlas and charts to take something which is globally defined, say some function on the manifold, and then look at a local representative of it, okay? So what the partitions of unity do in some sense then is to reverse the process. So now imagine that you have a function which is just you know defined, it's like on each of the coordinate charts, and you want to patch them together in some nice way. Um, and the way you do this is through these partitions of unity. So the reverse process of going from things which are local to a globally well-defined object on the manifold requires it's like or typically involves it's like these uh, partitions of unity. Okay? So um, so th that's that's a, an important it's a tool it's like to have in your arsenal, okay. And um, and in any case, right? So what happens then is that if you have house stuff and second countable together with the differentiable structure, then we call this a manifold structure, okay. So then the remark is that the differentiable structure. generates or that sort of induces a second countable Hausdorff to 
topology. It's called a manifold structure. So, so that um, gives you a quick introduction. It's like to the notions of uh, what a manifold is, and particularly what a smooth differentiable manifold is. Okay, um, and uh, we're going to use this um, as the setting. It's like for studying uh, our problem of optimization uh, on manifolds. So let me stop here. <coughs>